And we're going to begin at verse number 14 today in Revelation chapter 3. I want to ask the question tonight. Is there someone at the door? Revelation 3, 14, beginning at verse 14, we're standing in honor of the reading of God's word, and the word of the Lord reads, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou wert cold or hot, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him. I want to repeat that line. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and have sat down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Master, we thank you, God, for this opportunity to receive from your word. We thank you, God, for this chance to come into the house of God as free citizens of a free nation. Lord, at this hour, we ask that your anointing would rest heavily upon your messenger. Help me, God, to deliver the word that you placed in my spirit for this moment in time. God, that every person that hears it might be blessed, might be encouraged, might be uplifted. Lord, that they might find a higher place and a deeper depth than you than they've ever before known. Master Pan all this today we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. You may be seated today. You know, the Lord spoke to John, uh, the author of the book of Revelation, and he told John, I want you to write down what I have to say, and I want you to send it to the seven churches that are in Asia. And these were churches that were part of the foundation of Christendom. These churches were uh, the very earliest churches that exist, uh, existed in the, in the history of the Christian church. Many theologians believe that uh, the application for the messages, the messages that God has spoken to these various churches in the book of Revelation uh, for modern day, for the modern day church, is in the fact that we have experienced seven ages, or seven different periods that the church historically has gone through. And the last period and the last age that we will go through prior to the coming of the Lord is the Laodicean age. So therefore, the letter that the Lord had John write for him to the church at Laodicea would be the letter that the last church that will experience life on planet earth prior to the coming of the Lord, that's the letter we need to pay the most attention to. Well, I believe today we are in the last days. I believe today we're most certainly at the last hour. And I believe that as we read the letter that John uh, recorded, the words of Jesus in Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22, as we read the uh, words that the Lord spoke to him, there is much for us to learn here. Now, I'm not actually going to do a verse-by-verse -verse exegesis of this particular portion because there's a message within this message that I want, more importantly, to bring out tonight. But I want to bring a couple of quick things out for you to understand. First of all, when you read the words of Jesus in verse 15, 
uh, I'm sorry, in verse 14, where he said, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. There are some who have mistaken these words, who have no knowledge whatsoever of the Greek language and the original language that the scriptures were recorded in. And they have taken this to mean that Jesus Christ was the first creation of God because he said the beginning of the creation of God. That is not what is being said here. What is being said here is uh, the word beginning here in the Greek, if you go back, you will find that it literally means the foundation of the creation of God. In other words, all of the creation of God was built upon this. When you start a building project, when you begin a building project, what do you begin with? The foundation. Amen. You don't start the attic first. You don't start building the walls first. You don't start building the roof first. No. You must first lay a foundation. And that is what the Word of God is telling us. Jesus Christ was at the very, the Bible said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And today I want you to understand, Jesus Christ is not the beginning of God's creation. Jesus Christ is the reason for God's creation. He is the foundation upon which all of creation exists. Okay, now having said that, the Lord goes on to tell the Laodicean church, so then they could. He said, I know thy works, that thou art neither hot or cold nor hot. I want thou work cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Children, I'm going to tell you, if ever there is a people that is living in the Laodicean spirit of wealth and prosperity and not realizing how miserable and disgusting we really are, it is the nation we call America. We were just talking earlier today about how prison systems are so corrupt and how they're so foul that they stink and how things go on in prisons that you would think ought not to even be able to go on because that's why, you know, people are in jail to keep them away from drugs and people are in jail to keep them away from violence and people are in jail to keep them uh, away from things that can harm them or harm others and yet they get into the system and all of a sudden they find that the system is nothing more than a microcosm of the society that they left outside. It's just a miniature version of all the same corruption, all the same junk that they could get on the outside, they can get on the inside. And it's not because some of the prisoners are corrupt, it's because some of the guards and some of the wardens and some of the keepers, those people are corrupt. And I want you to know today, children, we've got to understand, we've got to look at things honestly, because if we don't, we're going to uh, experience the judgment of those who are judged. But we have got to be honest today and look and realize that the wealth and prosperity in this country all too often is brought about on the backs of the poor and on the backs of those who struggle and on the backs of those who strive to uh, have something in their lives. And then when the wealthy and the rich get done getting rich and when they get done putting more gold in their cover, then they throw these people aside like they're useless a uh, waste and they have nothing more to do with them. I was watching a program earlier this week that dealt with the uh, airline industry. And they were talking about how, how many of these airlines have requested of their employees and the employee unions that they give concessions in order to allow the airlines to continue to exist. And how the employees have given millions and millions, if not billions of dollars worth of concessions so they can keep their jobs and so that their neighbors and their friends can continue to have work. 
And one person called in to this program, I believe I was watching CNN, and this one person called in and said, I want to know one CEO that offered to give back the millions of dollars in bonuses that they get every year in order to keep people in work. I want to know how many of the CFOs and the CEOs are giving up all their millions of dollars in order to keep people working. No, they'll ask the union to ask the common man, the one who keeps the organization moving from the ground level up, from the grassroots up. That's the one they'll ask to give all these concessions. But what about the guy at the top of the heap? What about the guy who's the chairman of the board? What's he doing? Hey, Brother Moore, why are you sounding so negative on America today? I'm not negative on America. Our ideals are wonderful. But the reality is something different. We don't realize there are countries out there today that hate us and despise us, and they hate us and they despise us with good cause. Because out of one side of our mouth, we talk about freedom and liberty for all. Out of one side of our mouth, we talk about opportunity for everybody. Out of one side of our mouth, we talk about prosperity and uh, an achievement of being available to everybody. And yet out of the other side of our mouth, we've got a, about a 2% minority in the entire country who control the vast amounts of wealth that this country has. And they don't care about people. They don't care about jobs. They don't care about people going hungry. They don't care about families. They don't care about men killing themselves because they can't provide for their families and leaving their wife and children without a daddy and without a husband. They don't care about these things because it all boils down in the final analysis to the bottom line. It all boils down to uh, how much the shareholders are making. Children, we need to understand today, the Word of God is saying to the Laodicean church, because thou sayest I am rich and increased with good, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Jeff, God doesn't want us to be sitting like fools and saying one thing when in reality we're something entirely different. He wants us to be able to look at ourselves and our position and our situation and be honest about it. And somewhere in this country, somebody better wake up and start looking at our situation honestly. Because we're staring God in the face and telling him we're rich and increased with good. Oh, we're in the nation that's going to carry the gospel to all the world. And we're the most disgusting thing that God's ever laid eyes on. There's more abuse and more usury that goes on in this country than any country on the face of the planet. The poor in this country are constantly taken advantage of. They are miserably used and abused daily so that the rich can get richer, and yet we sit and say, I am rich and increased with good, and have need of nothing. You're disgusting, is what you are. America, you're vile. When your towers fall, and when your Pentagon is uh, crashed into, I want you to know, there's a reason for that, because you're disgusting, and you're vile, and you offend Many from other nations who look, and unlike ourselves, they can see our hypocrisy. And the title of hypocrite is well deserved by this nation as a whole. But then the Lord says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thy eyes without eyesight, that thou mayest see. My Lord, Lord said, not enough to put on clothes. It's not enough to cover your nakedness. It's not enough to get hold of riches that are real. It's not enough to start doing the right thing and get hold of riches that are real. But you know, Jeff, one of the most important things we can do as God's people is anoint our eyes with eyesight, so that we can look honestly. 
at ourselves and at the world around us and at the country in which we live. Hello now. See, a lot of people don't want to do that. They don't want to have to deal honestly. They don't want to have to look honestly at America. They don't want to have to look honestly at the church. If you look honestly at the church today, the church today is in the worst shape it's ever been in. We've got more show business in the church. There's less church and show business than there is show business in the church. Amen. You'll see fewer movies that deal with uh, the issue of God and the church and things of that nature. But honey, come into the church and you'll see them putting on all kinds of shows. Because show business has captured the church. We can thank Jan and Paul Couch for that foolishness. We've got to kill everything. God forbid, up on the platform you have a simple folding chair. Well, Jesus, help us know why we've got to have a, a gilded throne for the preacher to sit in. No, honey, you need to have a gilded throne for the one who's being preached to sit in, not for the preacher to sit in. I remember in Pennsylvania while I was pastoring there, I had found a beautiful antique chair, gorgeous gold uh, material with like a gold color, and it was white on the outside, very ornately framed. It was a Victorian-style armchair, you know, and it was broken into pieces. And I brought it into my house, and I fixed it up. Got it all put back together, made it look beautiful, look gorgeous. And I said, you know, I'm going to put that in the church. I'm going to put it on the platform. And Jason said, well, who's going to sit in it? I said, nobody. Nobody's going to sit in it. I said, that will be the chair that we have set for the honored guest. I said, and the honored guest in every one of our meetings is King Jesus. And if anybody in the church deserves to sit in the throne, it's King Jesus. I said, I'm not sitting in it, but I'm going to put it there as a representation of the presence of the Lord. But you see, now we got Paul and Jan and everybody, there ain't a one of them sitting up on that platform. Watch TVN sometimes. There's not a one of them that isn't sitting in a gilded chair with all this fancy scroll work and all this fancy woodwork and all this uh, ex exorbitant, you know, expense being put out to accommodate God's quote-unquote people and his preachers and his singers so that they can sit. God forbid they should sit in something that's anything less than, you know, $4,000 or $5,000 to sit in. God's people have bought into a lie. We have followed the course of the nation rather than changing the course of our nation. Do you hear me now? We have begun to imitate our uh, country rather than to affect our country. Let me tell you, back in the days of Wycliffe, back in the days of great men, um, the great revivals of the 1700s and the 1800s, uh, when some of the great men in history came through and were preaching what they knew of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I don't claim it was the whole gospel, because it wasn't, but what they knew they preached. And back then, they literally were able to change the course of community that they came into. They would go into towns and preach a revival. And when they were done, the bar owner would have to pack up and move to another town and open up a new business because nobody in that town was sinking anymore. Nobody in that town was going to the saloon anymore. Oh, God, oh, God, give us the day when the church is changing the world instead of the world changing the church. Lord, have mercy. You'll notice then the Lord said, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. He said, If I love you, then I'm going to rebuke you. <laughs> if you're in the wrong, I'm going to tell you. Well, honey, we brag that we're a Christian nation. We brag that we're God's nation, as it were, on the face of the planet. Well, sweetheart, if that be true, then watch out. Because that means that God's rebuke and God's chastening is right around the corner. Because if we indeed have that close and personal a relationship with the Lord as we say we do, then God says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. 
Repent means turn around. The direction you've been going in, change it. You've been going one way, chances are the, the best direction for you to go in at that point, Mother, is the opposite direction where you're going. Jan and Paul, you know what direction you need to go in? You need to start selling off some stuff, and you need to start going out and buying the simplest, plainest, nicest, simple furniture you can find and putting that on your set and repent and tell the people of God we have been wrong. We have presented Christianity as some sort of an opulent imitation of the Roman Catholic Church. Well, honey, that is not what it's all about. So we got folding chairs up here for T.D. Jakes the next time he comes to preach at TVN. And we got folding chairs up here for Mr. Olsteen the next time he comes to preach at TVN. These men can preach homosexuals into hell, and yet, all the while, they can uh, lead the church down a path of destruction and misery. Why? Because Jesus said they're blind. They cannot see what their real situation is. I'll tell you, if half these preachers could see in honesty what their own situation is, they wouldn't have a word to say about us. They'd be too busy. They'd be too humbled by what they see in the mirror. When you look into the mirror of God's holiness, honey, I'm going to tell you something. They'd be so humbled by what they saw, they wouldn't have time to preach against anybody. They wouldn't have time to preach down to anybody. I want to tell you today, that was just the lead up to my message, okay? Now I'm going to get into the message. Many people are daily influenced by sounds coming from high places and voices so loud that they drown out the background noises around them. Sadly, not every sound which comes from a pulpit is the voice of God. And not every voice that booms from the television or radio preacher represents the thoughts or feelings of God. In 1 Kings chapter 19, 11 through 13, And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind went the mountains, and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And that's where God was. He was in the still, small voice. There may be organizations out there today claiming to represent God who are able to make a lot of noise. There may be organizations and preachers out there today claiming to represent God who are really able to shake things up. There may be people out there like uh, Mr. Jerry Falwell who can really turn out the vote. But I've got news for you. If you want to hear God speaking, what you need to find is the little tiny church like the one you're in tonight. Because God is not in the earthquake. He's not in the wind. He's not in the fire. He's in that still, small voice. Hallelujah. And our voice may be a squeak compared to their squealing. But honey, I've got news for you. God is in this voice. Children, in his final message to the early church, the Lord wanted us to understand one very important truth. And that truth today is, he is standing at the door knocking. It is his voice that calls your name. And it is he that desires to come into your life and sup with you. Whatever other voices you may hear, listen carefully through all the noise. Somewhere amidst the clutter and confusion is the voice of the Master calling out your name with a sensitivity and sincerity so unmistakable that you can know for certain it is Him if you will only carefully listen. Oh, Jeff, there's a lot of preachers out there preaching messages. There's a lot of churches. There's a lot of organizations. There's a lot of different ones screaming their message at the top of their lungs. 
But I'm telling you today, if you listen carefully, if you listen carefully, you'll hear that gentle knock. It will make you get excited. And you're going to hear that little voice, a still, small voice, a gentle voice. On the other side of that door, it's going to say, hey, I just want to come in and eat with you. I just want to come in and be your friend. I'm not your enemy. I don't hate you. I haven't got any problem with you. I don't care who you are. I said I'm standing at the door and knocking. And if you'll open the door, the Bible said if any man will open the door. If any man. I don't care if you're straight, gay, black, white, what you are. If you'll open the door, Jesus said, I'll come in. I'll come in. All you've got to do is open the door to me. Give me the opportunity. In John chapter 10, verses 27 and 28, the word of the Lord tells us, My sheep know my voice, and I know them. They follow me, and I give them eternal life, so that they will never be lost. No one can snatch them out of my hand. I want you to know today, you can know the voice of God. You can know that God is speaking to you. You can know that the Lord is in the message this preacher preaches. You can know today that the Lord is standing at the door and He's knocking, wanting to come and be part of your life. If only you'll listen. Because when you hear His voice, you'll know it's His. God's voice, listen to this now. God's voice frequently says things that religious men rebel against and zealots despise to hear. That still small voice, a lot of times it's saying stuff that a lot of these TV preachers, you know what? You know why they ain't hearing it? Because they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. You know what used to pick people off in Jesus' day? It wasn't because he was preaching that Judaism wasn't strict enough and they needed to get stricter. He was preaching that Judaism was man-made and too constricted. And they needed to loosen up a little. And all of a sudden, everybody got mad. Because he's going against our rules. He's going against our regulations. He's going against our commandments. He's going against our traditions. There are those out there that send me dirty, nasty, foul emails all the time because of the ministry that I'm in today. And you know why? Because we're going against their teaching. We're going against their commandments. We're going against their doctrines. We're going against their dogmas. We're going against their traditions. It's the same fight, different day. But I got news for them. When God speaks, a lot of times, Tommy, when the Lord speaks, <laughs> he has to say, Religious folk don't want to hear. I got news for you. I, and I, you know, I'm, I hate to do this to him sometimes, but, you know, it makes a point, and everybody understands the point. Brooklyn, New York, and Bethel wouldn't know how to hear from God if he stepped down, stood in front of them, and shouted in their face because they wouldn't want to hear what he said when he said it. Now, that's where the Jehovah's Witnesses had their headquarters. It's called Bethel. They would, you know, over there in Salt Lake City, the Council of Elders, honey, they wouldn't know God's voice if he stood in front of them and shouted till the, uh, the hair on his face was touching theirs. Why? Because they wouldn't want to hear it. Because he'd be saying things just like Jesus said things when he was here. He'd be saying things they don't want to hear. He'd be saying things that contradict their teaching, that contradict their uh, all of their dogma, that contradict all of their tradition. That's been the case from the beginning of time. When the Lord began to speak to me about affirming ministry years, almost 12 years ago now, it was so hard for me. <laughs> Because what he was saying was so contrary to everything I'd ever heard. And I said, Lord, that can't possibly be you. It sounds like you, but it can't be you. But sometimes when God speaks, 
what it has to say is not necessarily what people want to hear. I remember the story in Acts chapter 10 verses 9 through 15 when Peter was on the rooftop and he heard from the Lord in a rooftop experience, Acts chapter 10, 9 through 15. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, and he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him. <laughs> Listen, this is God speaking. Rise, Peter, till and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again. The second time, remember, Jeff, this is God speaking, hallelujah. And the Lord said, what God has cleansed, that call not thou common, hallelujah. Right. You see, what God has to say, he knows it's what we want to hear. Right. Peter was looking, he was hungry, he was very hungry. He's looking at a bunch of animals right in front of him. And the very voice of God said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But he still wanted to do it. Here was God speaking to him, and he still wanted to do it. Because of his tradition, because of his law, because of his commandment. And God turned around and said, Peter, what I have called clean, don't you dare call it common. If I tell you, Peter, to get up and eat it, you get up and eat it. Hallelujah. Oh, oh. <laughs> you see, yeah. what God has to say and know is what we want to hear. Yeah. Amen. It turns out the message Peter received on that rooftop that day had nothing to do with hamburgers or hot dogs. It had nothing to do with unclean or clean food. Oh, God was preparing Peter to bring the message of the gospel to the Gentile nations. Hallelujah. And when he got there, he realized God has taught me a lesson. Anybody, anywhere who fears him and lives right is accepted with him. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. My Lord, when God speaks, it didn't know is what we want to hear. Philip heard from the Lord regarding the need for him to witness to a certain eunuch. But Lord, the eunuchs are unclean. The eunuchs are written out in the law. They have no place in the temple. But God said, listen, Acts 8, 26 through 29. But an angel of the Lord said to Peter, Rise and go forward toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. And he rose and went, and behold, an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a minister of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem to worship, and was returning Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah, and the Spirit said, listen to him now, and the Spirit said, this is God talking, and the Spirit said, go up and join this chariot. He may be unclean according to the law. He may not be accepted according to the law. He may not be part of the temple proceedings. But Philip, I'm telling you right now, you go and join yourself to this chariot. I want you to bring the gospel to this man because the gospel is not bound by the same tradition and the same foolishness that you're coming out of. Oh, glory to God. 
I'll tell you, when God speaks, it ain't always what people want to hear. Amen. <laughs> the Spirit of God seldom speaks things which are easy for mortal men and women to readily embrace. It is so much easier to sit in judgment and to mercilessly criticize those whom we do not understand. But nobody ever said serving the Lord would be easy. Today, my friends, many of us have heard the voice of the Lord through all the noise and booming confusion. Today we have heard the voice of the Lord speak to us the comforting words, My child, my grace is sufficient for you. <laughs> Whatever voices you might have allowed, to influence your life and your choices concerning serving the Lord, you will one day stand before your Maker, and you will hear only this one question being posed, could you not hear me calling? I don't care what voices you allow to influence your decisions about serving God, when you stand before the Lord in judgment, honey, right. he, he ain't going to care about, well, I let the Pope tell me. I let Brooklyn tell me. I let Salt Lake City tell me. I let this one tell me. I let that one tell me. Uh-uh, honey. The Lord's going to say, could you not hear me calling? Yeah, right. Could you not, in the midst of all those voices, hear me? Yeah. Didn't you recognize my voice there anywhere? Right. Didn't you hear me talking to you anywhere? In the midst of all that, Lord, there'll be people who will wind up in hell who are going to say, but I was condemned because of who I was. There was no hope for me anyway, so why should I try to serve God? And the Lord's going to say, could you not hear me calling you? Could you not hear me knocking? Well, Lord, no, uh, Jared Powell said, and Fred Phelps said, and this one said, and that, uh, I don't care what they said. Could you not hear me calling you? See, I learned a long time ago, I've got a little bit of a hearing problem. Tommy, don't you say number or I'll slap you. <laughs> I'm just waiting for him to boom out. Little <laughs> man! I've got a bit of a hearing problem. <laughs> and I've learned a long time ago, it's inherited. My dad had the same problem. Yeah. I learned a long time ago, Mom, that there can be all kinds of racket going on a lot of times. And if I can focus real carefully on the one I'm talking to, yes, I can hear every word you're saying. Yes, I just cannot afford to allow myself to be distracted yes. by all the other voices. That's, right. That's what people need to do. When it comes to your walk with God, it's your walk with God. You need to focus on talking with Him. You need to look straight into His face and don't move your eyes for a moment. And don't allow your ears to, to wander off, but focus in on His lips moving and you see what He has to say. Don't just hear what He has to say. See what He has to say. See it and hear it at the same time. That way you'll know it's Him talking. That's right. Amen. But too many people, the Lord said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and let me in, Lord Jesus. Oh, you may feel excluded today. Someone may have told you that you're too bad or simply not good enough. But the Master today stands outside the door and he's knocking. And he's calling. Will you listen today carefully for that knock? Have you ever been anticipating a delivery? Have you ever had a package coming and you knew it was coming? And boy, you could be so tired. I mean, just so exhausted. You, you crawl into that bed and you're out like a light. But the second you hear a tap, I don't know how many times. I've jumped up out of my bed and run down to my door and slung it open with a pen in hand to sign for my package, only to find out that some woodpecker had gotten up on the side of my house. Because when you're tuned in to hear certain sounds, 
then you're much more inclined to hear them. And I want you to understand today, the Lord said, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. I'm knocking and I'm calling. And Jeff, I'm saying to God's people today, for everybody out there that might hear this message by tape, on the internet, whatever means they might hear it, I want them to understand today, if you'll tune in to hear from God, you will hear from God. The Lord won't let you down. Now, he may not say what you're accustomed to hearing. He may say something that'll shake up a little bit because you're going to find out that you're not condemned and you're not uh, thrown in the trash. And you'll find out that all of a sudden you're not because of who you are. He does not ostracize you. And he does not suddenly want nothing to do with you. So you may be surprised by a lot of what the Lord has to say. But that's it. If you'll just listen carefully to the sound, you'll hear him knock. If you listen carefully for his voice, you'll hear him speak. And when you do look in his direction, lock eyes. Look carefully into his face and don't let any of all the distracting voices on either side of you, don't let any of those distract you. Remember Peter wound up falling into the water because he allowed himself to be distracted. Instead of keeping his eyes on Jesus, he allowed himself to be distracted. Is there someone at the door? Is the title of this message. Yes, indeed there is. Your Creator, become your Savior, wants today to become your intimate friend. That simple. Amen. Would you stand with me tonight? Amen, amen, amen. Is there someone at the door? Oh, yes, there is. Just listen for the knock. Listen for his voice. If he tells you something that goes against what tradition's been telling you and what the dogma of the church you grew up in has been telling you, then, honey, that's God. <laughs> He's been doing that for millennium now. He's been shocking people with truth because truth doesn't always coincide with what is the accepted norm for the day. Amen. Master, we thank you, God, for this day. We thank you for your word. We ask God today that you would just take this message as simple as it is. Help us, Lord, to apply it to every part of our heart. Help us to understand today, Lord, this wonderful truth. There's someone knocking, and if we'll tune in, we'll hear that knock. And we'll be able to respond, Lord, to that knock. We'll be able to respond to your voice. Help us, Lord, to hear from you. Help us to focus on you so that we can hear from you. Jesus, speak to us today. We need the voice of God in our lives now more than ever. Grant it, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Bless the fellowship, the time, the food we share, God, together. Let everything be done to the glory of our King, for we ask it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.